Hello, everybody. Peter Greenberg here. Welcome to our most recent global travel update for this last Thursday of March 2024. I hope you're having a great time wherever you happen to be. Let me tell you where we happen to be. We're cruising on the Seine. We're in France. And no, we're not in Paris. We were in Paris, but we're heading down the Seine all the way to get as close as we can to Normandy. As many of you know, 2024 marks the 80th anniversary of D-Day. We'll be broadcasting from there. But for those of you who think you know the Seine, chances are you don't. A good friend of our show and my former colleague at Newsweek, Elaine Chilino from the New York Times, wrote a great book about it called The Seine, The River That Made Paris, and she's not kidding. The Seine is 485 miles long, all the way from Paris to the sea. Uh, it really is the, the river that defines France when you think about it. Yes, there's the Loire, but there really is the Seine. You'll be, the Seine will also be the site of some of the Olympic uh, sport this summer. We'll get to that a little bit later. Uh, but if you get a chance, read Elaine's book, The River That Made Paris, called The Seine, of course. Uh, we're right now in Vernon. No, not Vernon, California, Vernon, France. And we're heading that way towards the, lake, the, the closest port we can get to, to Normandy and the beaches. Uh, so much to talk about this week. Speaking of the water, we're on board the Viking longship Ragrid. And Ragrid means, stands for the last of the great Valkyries, the handmaidens of Odin, the father of all the gods. And uh, they do a great job. And they'll take us all the way to as close as we get to Normandy and then back to Paris. Uh, and uh, they, they've got so many great ships cruising the rivers. And this year, the river levels are reasonable and they're decent. Um, and uh, no no problems encountered on the way. Uh, some narrow fits under bridges. We made every one of them, and not to mention getting through the locks. But now let's go to talk about the news. And this week, it has not been good at all. We'll start with the Baltimore, the F. Scott Key Bridge, F. Scott Key Bridge. Uh, as you may know, I cover these disasters when they happen, and this one is uh, no exception. Uh, what most people don't realize is this is not some rogue crew on a ship. This is a ship that had some serious problems and on board that ship, as every ship does, leaving any U.S. harbor, there was at least one harbor pilot on board. You need that local knowledge. And what happens is the harbor pilot, whether it's a cargo ship, a container ship, or a cruise ship, takes the ship out of the harbor. And when it's a safe distance out of the harbor, the harbor pilot shows up. The harbor pilot continues. Uh, at about 1.25 in the morning, uh, the name of the ship was, was the Dolly. It was under making about eight knots. So this all comes from the NCSP today because they're able to release the data from the what? The voice, the actual uh, data uh, cruise recorder. No, no different than a cockpit voice recorder that you'll find on an airplane. It's a little bit bigger than that. And it records all the important dynamics of the ship, not just its speed, its direction, propulsion, uh, rudder angle, uh, electrical supplies, you name it, it's on that data recorder. And what's happened with that data recorder is it's called the Voyage Data Recorder, the VDR. And they were able to determine that at 1.25 in the morning, uh, the ship was underway in the channel, making about eight knots, a little bit faster than normal, steering about 141 degrees. But, it, but just at that moment, alarms went off in the bridge and the VDR ceased recording. Why? They had an electrical failure. Then they had a steering failure. Then they had a propulsion failure. They used to back up power and record the audio and the radio, as well as the pilots. This is a horrible. But one minute later, uh, they were able to resume the recording, but it was a general VFF call for tug assistance. That was going to be too late. Tugs could not get out there and fa fast enough. And then you had the first distress call. It was a mayday. Uh, and luckily, they got the word out to the, the authority that operates the Francis Scott Key Bridge. And they got an early warning out in time to get the police out there quickly to start shutting down traffic to the bridge. That obviously saved a lot of lives. Uh, and then... Uh, at 127, this is happening very fast, two minutes before the, the ship actually contacted the bridge pier, the pilot gave the order to drop the anchor to try to increase the drag. It didn't matter. The ship only slowed to seven knots. Keep in mind, momentum of, on a ship this large is enough to take out entire piers and harbors. 
I've seen it happen. You've seen some other videos where that's happened as well. Uh, next thing you know, they, they, they basically radioed that they lost all power again. They were approaching the key bridge at 127. And guess what? We all know what happened when you saw that video at 129. Devastating how fast that bridge collapsed. It is still collapsed, meaning that, that the harbor is closed to all incoming and outgoing traffic and may be for some, some time to come. If there's any good news here, uh, from a from a, a, an operational point of view, it's that the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers that does such great work. They did it following a number of hurricanes. They've already been dispatched to try to figure out first of all how to get. It's now become a salvage operation. How to get the remaining steel out of the harbor, and there's a lot of it. Then how to remove it safely from the bow of that ship without causing additional damage. Then to move the ship. Then if necessary, to dredge the channel because how much steel is on the bottom and affecting the draft opportunities of the ships that pass over it. And then, and only then, to not only try to reopen the channel, but then to start getting a bridge, a temporary bridge in place to ease the traffic problems that are inevitable now since it was such a main artery. Uh, we will be following this investigation. Uh, now, some of you may wanna know why there are no tugboats helping the ship out to begin with. Well, tugboats have not been used in many cases when ships have what they call thrusters. Uh, they, these are in the bow and the stern. They move the ship sideways, laterally, uh, but they don't. But they can't control forward progress, right? You can move the ship left or right, but it, but it doesn't move very fast when you move when you do it at that speed. And as a result, we had a uh, we had the damage that we had. Uh, so most of the major cruise ships today do not require tug assistance. Most of the major cargo ships today don't require tug assistance because those thrusters are built into the ships. Um, and some of these ships even have something called dynamic positioning, where they, no matter how rough the water, they can maintain their position just using their thrusters. None of this was in play at 1.25 in the morning the other night. Uh, they didn't have enough time to do it, quite frankly. This happened so quickly. The other question that's being raised is what could be built on either side of the support stanchions of the bridge to serve as a fender, as a buffer, so that that gets hit first, way before the bridge gets hit. Uh, that's something they're going to have to discuss, and they're going to have to build into the new design. That will be inevitable as well. We will stay on top of that story and as it develops. And believe me, uh, we have a joint investigation now by, by both the U.S. Coast Guard and the National Transportation Safety Board, and we know what great work the NTSB does, which, which leads me to my next story, which, of course, the continuing NTSB investigation into the accident January 5th where the door panel blew out of the Alaskan Airlines 737 on a flight from Portland to California. Luckily, no one died, but it set off alarm bells everywhere. And it reopened, ultimately, a criminal probe by the U.S. Department of Justice into Boeing and their behavior. What happened this week? A huge explosion, big shakeup in the executive ranks at, at, uh, at Boeing. The CEO announced his retirement. Uh, the head of the commercial plane division announced he was leaving immediately. And the chairman of the board, a man by the name of Larry Kellner, who I've known for a long time, he also announced he would not stand for re-election when the board meets in May. That's coming up in about a month. Interesting thing about Larry Kellner, his last job before he went to Boeing, he was the CEO of Continental Airlines, which brings up the issue of CEOs of airlines. The CEOs of the airlines asked for a meeting, uh, and they asked for a meeting with the board of directors without the CEO present. What does that tell you about a loss of confidence in Boeing? And we're talking about the CEOs of United, Southwest, American, and Alaska. Uh, the message was clear. He had to leave, uh, and he did. But keep in mind, let's put this in perspective. He's the second CEO to leave in five years. The last one left after the terrible crashes in 2018 and 2019 of the two Boeing 737 MAX jets in Ethiopia and Indonesia that killed 346 people. Now, the one thing that the FAA has been doing this week is they've announced increased scrutiny on United Airlines. Why? Eight separate incidents in uh, in just a few days, right? In two weeks, actually. Now, none of which are related to Boeing. So too many people conflated that with a Boeing issue. It's not. It's a United issue. If an airplane loses a tire, that's not a Boeing issue, uh, unless every Boeing plane loses tires, which they don't. Uh, if a plane leaks hydraulic fluid, that's a maintenance issue, not a Boeing issue. We had uh, one, one plane that veered off the runway. It's a pilot issue. Uh, we had uh, an engine fire that was caused by burning plastic wrap that somehow got sucked into the engine. That's just, that happens. 
right? Luckily, none of these were life-threatening. Nobody was injured. But of course, everybody with a cell phone becomes a journalist. And everything that happens on a plane now is going to be photographed. It just was not its unlucky day to get that. I want to put this in perspective. If I were to take you, and I may have mentioned this last week, but it, it bears repeating. If I were to take you in, into a tower of any major U.S. airport, DFW, O'Hare, Atlanta, LAX, J you would hear the fire department being banged out 30 to 40 times a day at the airport. Why? Well, let's say 40 times. Of those 40 times, 30 are medical. A passenger is sick on a plane, a passenger is sick at the airport. Of course, every fire department responds with all their EMT guys, so they respond. But what about the other 10 times? It may be a faulty warning light that goes on in the cockpit that says that the landing gear has not been locked. That scrambles the fire department. Turns out, a faulty warning light. Uh, or a pressure valve that doesn't register. Anything that goes on that's out of the ordinary, they will call it in and the fire department gets scrambled, right? It's as simple as that. But when you have 35,000 planes in the air every day, at least you're going to have some of those incidents. But how many people died yesterday? How many planes crashed today? Remember, we've just celebrated the 30 safest years in commercial aviation since aviation began. But that's not the point. I'm cutting around to the point. The point is, Who's regulating? Who's inspecting? And how do we maintain that batting average? Can't increase it. It's that good. But how do we maintain it? That's the challenge. And so while everybody's focusing on Boeing and, and, and United, I'm focusing on the FAA because the fish thinks from the head. And the FAA has not been doing its job effectively as a regulator. It didn't understand that Boeing was not its client. We are. It didn't understand that the airlines are not its partners. We aren't, we aren't either. Nobody are. Nobody should be their partners. They should be an independent federal regulatory agency that enacts and enforces safety and makes the rules. They need to get back to that. And the only way they can get back to that is if Congress gives them enough money in the budget to allocate for the hiring and the training of the proper staff to do that work. Now, how does this all affect you? In the long term, well, in the, I'll give you the short term first. In the short term, you're going to have a disruptive summer because with, with the assembly line at Boeing slowing to a crawl, if not stopped, the airlines aren't getting their planes that they need. Already Southwest Airlines has adjusted its summer schedule that they'd already published because they don't have the planes to fly it, which means fewer flights, maybe some routes that get cut. United Airlines has adjusted their pilot training schedules. Again, they don't have enough planes. So if you thought planes are full last summer, huh, get ready for this summer. And you know what happens when the planes are full? Airfares have nowhere to go up, but up, up, up and away. So that's what we're thinking about now. But the long-term effects, that's what we have to focus on. And that's where Congress really has to focus on redefining the definition of the FAA. Make sure that they understand their job. Make sure that they do their job. And by the way, it's not just about the assembly line and inspections. It's about maintenance and maintenance oversight, what we call MROs, Maintenance Repair Operations. And not all of them are in the United States. Where is the oversight for all those MROs overseas that so many U.S. airlines are sending their planes to for maintenance? Tell me who's watching the store there. By the way, that's a rhetorical question. Because the FAA doesn't have the staff to do it. And should an FAA inspector want to go? This is the crazy part. I may have mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, but I'm going to say it again. There's a rule within the FAA that the FAA has to alert this MRO and give them at least a week's notice that they're coming. Are you kidding me? That's like the restaurant getting a call from the health department saying we're going to inspect the kitchen in a week. That accomplishes nothing. All right, so that's my diatribe with the FA, United, Oversight, and you name it. Uh, and as we wait to see what, who, what the new leadership is uh, at, the, at, the, at Boeing, let me remind you what Henry Stonecipher said. He was one of the last CEOs, which where this problem started, right? We've gone from a CEO mentality to a CFO mentality. There was, a, there was a time not too long ago where all my friends who were pilots would say, in fact, they even had stickers made saying, if it's not Boeing, I'm not going. I get it. Why was that? They trusted in the engineering. They trusted in the design, the materials, installation, and the actual workmanship. Well, this is what Stone Cipher said. He said, when people say I changed the culture of Boeing, that was the intent so that it's run like a business rather than a great engineering firm. Red flag. I want it to be a great engineering firm 
We'll worry about the business later. They're going to make as much money as they want anyway because they're the only game in town. Remember, the airlines don't have leverage right now to say, well, we don't like Boeing anymore. We're going to buy Airbus. Oh, they can say that, but they're going to have to wait four years for a plane because the order books at Airbus are already full. So how are they going to figure this out together, understanding what their roles are? Not partners, not clients. You get the drift. Okay. Let's move on. Here we are in France, where the Olympics are happening this, this summer, and, and the fares are going through the roof. Hotel rooms now are about two to $3,000 a night, and uh, they've even raised the rates of the Paris Metro and, and the admission to the Louvre. So if you want to be smart and you want to come see France, do what I just did. Take a long boat cruise in March and April or come back in September, which, of course, is the magic month in Europe. Always has been, always will be. Uh, Speaking of other crazy things we're going to talk about, what's the fastest growing piece of luggage that's being sold right now? Uh, an overnight bag? Nope. Carry-on bag? Nope. Big suitcase or trunk? Absolutely not. It's backpacks. Why? Because people want to wear their luggage on the plane. They don't want to get it checked, and they don't want to get it lost. Now, the airlines are sort of getting smart about that now, and they're now making the backpacks go in those sides of machines. So, so please... Uh, pack wisely. All right. Uh, we'll get back to that later too. Uh, now, let's go to some of your comments and then I got more stuff to add because we got tons of stuff to talk about today. Okay. Jim and Harriet are saying they're back from uh, Dhaka. Okay. Uh, Paul is saying hello from wet Ashland, Virginia. Priya is saying watching from Chicago, waiting for warm weather. Listen, based on the way this winter is gone, you're going to be cross country skiing in Chicago in three weeks because it's been such a mild winter. Uh, all right. Hello from Williamsburg to Robin. Here we go. Michael is saying, I just heard that France is at their highest terror security now due to the terrorism in Russia. How will this affect July travel to Charles de Gaulle and maybe the Olympics? Every European country is on a high level of alert after what happened in Russia. Russia would let you, let you believe that it was Ukraine. It wasn't. It was ISIS. We know that. In fact, it was the United States government that warned Russia it was going to happen. And Russia didn't pay attention. Uh, all right, Randy's saying hello from Ann Arbor. Sue's saying hello from Bellingham, Washington. And Mesa, Arizona, saying hello from Joanne. Uh, Colleen says I'll be flying from SFO to Frankfurt during uh, the sweet spot after Thanksgiving. Uh, is the 54-day rule still the rule of thumb? Yeah, you're going You're going to book way too early now if you want to buy a ticket. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, okay, howdy from Lima, Ohio. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> The best place for the eclipse. Speaking of the eclipse and price gouging, it's out of control. The FAA is reporting a record number of flights to places in Indiana and Ohio uh, that's going to be following the trajectory of the of the eclipse on April 8th. And, and uh, that also goes for hotels as well. Uh, Cliff Elif is saying hello. Patty's saying on the send. Please explain. I did, Patty. Uh, Michael's saying sound is breaking up. You have a bad connection. Well, I'm on the river. I hope you're getting it now. Uh, Adrian saying hi, Peter. Uh, oh, Dayton, Ohio is weighing in. Camilla saying from Tucson, as she always does. Debbie saying hi from Buffalo. I'll be up in Buffalo soon, near Buffalo, in Jamestown, New York. We'll be actually broadcasting from there. Uh, okay, here we go. Uh, where am I on the set? I'm in Vernon, on my way to to uh, Normandy. Uh, Joy is saying going to a resort in Mexico in June. Can you? Can you dispute resort fees at a resort? You can dispute resort fees on the moon, but you have to do it. Remember, the fact that they're in that uh, brochure or the fact that they mention that it's mandatory does not mean it's not negotiable. I'm telling you. Uh, okay. Patty says, United, my favorite since 1960. Okay. Uh, okay. Let's see. I'm going to hold my... Is Tayo, I think that is, or Ty, says... How to get better deals on flights and accommodations. Seems like flights are more expensive than last year. They are. Uh, and uh, point redemptions are dismal. They are. Uh, do you trust budget carriers? I do. As long as you know what you're buying, right? They're going to charge you for everything short of breathing. So the airfare that they're charging you is just an introductory get your attention fare. That is not the fare you're going to pay unless you're walking on the plane in shorts and carrying nothing. And they might even charge you to wear shorts. I haven't checked that fee out yet. Uh, now, if you want to get the better deal on flights, here's what you do. You, you book on a Wednesday. 
look three weeks ahead on a Wednesday, unless it's the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, and you look at alternate airports, Providence instead of Boston, Oakland instead of San Francisco, Midway instead of O'Hare, even Milwaukee instead of O'Hare, you'll probably do better. Uh, okay, how do we know if we are flying a Boeing when we book a flight? Easy. If you're booking a flight online, uh, under details, you'll see a little box called or a little blue link called details. It will tell you the name of the plane. Now, that's the name of the plane that's scheduled to fly your trip. They may substitute equipment later on, but that's the one that's scheduled. If you're going um, to any other service, any other online service, it will tell you that. If you're going through a travel agent, they will tell you that. Or you pick up the phone and call the airline, and they will tell you that. Okay? But remember, even though the airlines have been somewhat accommodating and rebooking people who don't want to fly on a Boeing, that presumes there's space on any of their other flights and other equipment, which just may not be available. Okay? Uh, now, you also ask, what happens if they change plans at the last minute? You have the option to say, I don't want to fly the plane, but you may be stuck at the airport for a while. Okay, here we go. Ah, John Lample, who always makes me jealous every week by telling me where he is in the world, has announced he's saying hello from the Oceania Serena on the repositioning cruise across the Atlantic. I hope you got a Wi-Fi package deal, John, and enjoy the cruise. Um, okay. Hello from uh, the Palm Beaches, says uh, says Alberto. Debbie wants to know Buffalo Eclipse gouging too. Okay, everybody's gouging. Uh, greetings from the Bay Area, says Joan. Nice rain here. Uh, ah, Patty's absolutely right. If you want to know where Monet hung up, it was right here in Vernon, otherwise known as Givernay. Uh, and remember, we're celebrating this year the 150th anniversary of the Impressionists. What a great time to be here. Uh, Okay, Gail's, Gail is in rainy Pennsylvania. Vivian's saying hello from Pennsylvania as well. Sue says, we are going to Paris and Normandy in May. We are also staying in Bayou. Can you recommend any places to see that are not typically tourist attractions? Well, you're going to Bayou because you want to see the tapestry. I know that. The problem is you're going in May, which is great. Going in June, you'll be, you'll be crowded out. So in May, that's great. But look at Bayou as, on the map as a hub. And look at day trips you can take from Bayou that, that go beyond just the tapestry. Because wherever you're going to stay in Bayou is about a three or four minute walk to the tapestry. It's been designed that way. All right. Uh, if you go to our website, petergreenberg.com, in about a week, we'll have some suggestions for you for there. Okay. Uh, Gail is saying, have you ever used Porter Airlines to get to Canada? What was your opinion about this? Excellent. We love Porter Airlines. They have a little airline that could and they do, plus they fly to my favorite airport in the world, at least in North America, and that's Billy Bishop, Toronto. It's on a small little island next to downtown Toronto. It's the My goal in life is to open a restaurant at Billy Bishop Airport. Okay, I admit it. Uh, and they used to just fly, used to fly the Q400s. They're also now flying jet service, and they're going now to the, they're going to the U.S. on jet service to the West Coast. I think the San Francisco and Los Angeles, so from Toronto, so check them out. Porter does a great job. If I go to Halifax, I want to go on Porter. Uh, and I'll, I'll be going up to Toronto in a couple of weeks uh, on Air Canada, and they've started to improve as well, and we'll talk about that. But uh, as a small airline, i got to love Porter. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, Boston Bob says, Amex acquiring CWC reminds me of their acquisition years ago of Thomas Cook. Why is Amex acquiring CWT? Because Chase is about to eat their lunch. What Chase has done is they've realized that 30 million card members love to travel. So what did Chase do? They bought two or three different travel agencies. They want to give you a human connection. They're opening up airport lounges all over the United States, starting in LaGuardia and a number of other, another, other uh, airports. And they are using their credit cards, in this case, the Chase Sapphire Reserve, as a great alternative to the typical airline mileage affinity card where you're chasing miles and paying 26% interest. So right now there's a there's a war going on between Chase, Capital One, and Amex. And I gotta tell you, you've heard me talk about Amex before on the show. Amex is losing that war. Amex is arrogant, they haven't adjusted quickly, and they're playing catch up. And that's why they just bought uh, Carson, well, Carson Wagon Lee Travel, CWT. Uh, uh, if it's enough for them, we'll find out. Uh, okay. All right, here we go. Hello from Blowing Rock, says Ginger. Uh, Karina says, greetings from Florida. Do you know how often the airline seatbelts get checked? 
flew on four AA flights last month, and three of the seatbelts didn't lock into place, just sliding out. I haven't heard that in a long time. I would, I will, we'll check into that because I'm not aware of that. I, seat belts are seat belts. I mean, unless you were flying in a 1949 DC six, um, which by the way, the seat belts might even work better, but we'll check that out. Thank you for bringing that to our attention. Uh, and John Lontville says, we did get the Wi-Fi package. Of course you did. Otherwise you never would have reached out to me in the middle of the ocean because you're so cheap. Just kidding, John. We love you. Uh, Sue Gilman says, thanks, Peter. Uh, Melissa says, I saw you at the travel show in Santa Clara. I plan on going to the legal seafood restaurant in Boston. Okay. Let me know how that works. Uh, Michael says, and Amex slams you if you try to cancel their expensive cards. I know. We're going to get to an Amex Delta Airlines story in just a little bit, which I think at least some of you will laugh about. All right. I'm holding that till later because it's well worth the wait. Um, and Gail says, thank you for your comments about Porter. We hope to go to Quebec City in the fall. Good. Well, let me know how Porter is. I think they do a, a great job. In fact, let's do this right now. In fact, I'll tell you my Delta story now uh, and my American Express story. You know that Delta has made a situation worse for themselves by over over promising and overselling perks that they can't deliver. And that applies to their what? Their Sky Clubs, the old former Crown Room, right? We all know the situation for those of us who are frequent flyers. Getting to the airport at six o'clock in the morning for an eight o'clock flight, only to see a line 90 people deep just trying to get into the lounge, right? And they're members, right? And and then of course we've seen, you know, and they're trying to figure out how they limit your time there, what you can do, what you can't do. It defeats the entire purpose of why you joined the lounge, or in some cases, why you got an American Express card that offered you the perk that you can't use. Okay. So consider this a story about this happened this week. At, in Minneapolis at the airport, at the Delta Sky Club Lounge, a member who's paying $700 a year for the for the right to go into the lounge, assuming you get in, is in the lounge, and as he's leaving to get to his flight, there's a whole bunch of bananas there. He takes a banana for his flight. And guess what? They scolded him for stealing fruit. So he wrote about it, and it went viral, and Everybody now is doing banana jokes about Delta, right? BYOB, right? Bring your own bananas. And uh, show this picture that just posted from the Delta Lounge. Can you see it? <laughs> They're hanging bananas everywhere. Look, guys, I didn't join the club to get old hummus and, and sweaty carrots and cheese. The reason why you join a club like that is to not stand on any line and have a little peace and quiet while you wait for your flight, wait for your connection, or or sit out a delay, right? Now, to their credit, Delta does a better job than most airlines in terms of their food offerings. They've gotten much better. I give them credit for that. Uh, America needs to catch up. United is doing better, but United is doing something that Delta hasn't figured out yet. United is offering, if you go to their Denver uh, club, they have basically grab-and-go food. I mean, they have refrigerators full of stuff that they encourage you to take and take to the plane, right? Isn't that the way it should be, right? United has figured it out. So their clubs are never crowded because people are coming in, getting what they need and leaving with what they need. Delta's taking a census on bananas. Ridiculous. So uh, let's see what happens with Bananagate now. But uh, if you go in the, uh, some of the, the, you know, the chat rooms about, you know, about frequent flyers, I guarantee you, you are going to see bananas. All right. So there's my Delta banana story. Now let's go to some of the questions you've asked, asked earlier in the week. Uh, Matt says, has New Orleans ever considered changing their airport code to J-A-Z, as in jazz? Well, you know that the airport code for New Orleans is MSY, but what's the name of the New Orleans airport? The Louis Armstrong Airport. You're never going to change that name, so don't count on it. Uh, okay. And Jim says, wasn't there an effort to change Fresno from FAT, which stood for Fresno Air Terminal, to FYI, Fresno Yosemite International? There was, and it went nowhere. Uh, Carol says, do you think United is being sabotaged at this point? No, I don't. I think people are hypersensitive. They've all got their cell phone cameras out. And, you know, somebody hiccups, they'll take a picture. Look, eight incidents in a month, okay? Today is March we're almost at the end of the month. Today's March 20, what, 28th? 
All right, in three days, it'll be the end of March, which will mean United Airlines will have had 131,000 departures and they had eight non-life-threatening incidents. I'll take those odds any day of the week. No, they're not being sabotaged. They're being focused on. Uh, okay. Uh, Janice wants to know, we love this, why is the airport in Lima such a disaster? Because the Peruvians haven't gotten their act together yet, and the airlines have outsourced almost all their personnel, so there's nobody there with the ability to make a decision. There's your problem. Forget the infrastructure limits of the actual terminal. We're talking about the intellectual limits of the people who work there, not because they're not smart, but because they're not given the permission to do the right thing. There's your problem. Everybody has to seek approval to breathe. This is not the way to run an airport. Uh, okay, Francis, hi, Peter, looking to go to Prague and Budapest in May. Best way to sightsee with a husband who doesn't like to walk that much. Well, if you're in Budapest, you're in luck because you're on the Danube. You can do a lot of tours by boat. And it's beautiful, although I have to caution you, the Danube is not blue. Forgetting that romanticized idea, you're going to have a great time. Prague, on the other hand, is the city that was designed for walking. And even if your husband doesn't like to walk, he's going to love Prague. I guarantee you. I mean, we're not talking long walks. We're talking leisurely walks where every 10 feet you're discovering something new, something historic. And yes, if my wife's not listening, about every 40 feet there's a candy store. Yes. Uh, well, she was looking, so I didn't get to buy. But the point is, walk in, in, in Prague, have fun on the water in Budapest. Uh, okay. Here's one that says, last week, my flight was, this is from Jay. Last week, my flight was delayed five hours, but they never told us why. Are we legally supposed to know this information? Legally, no. Ethically, morally, yes. And what did you do for those five hours? Were you delayed on the flight, Jay, on the actual plane? or you delayed at the terminal. If you were delayed at the terminal or you delayed on the plane, didn't you think at one point to get up, raise your hand and ask them why? Or you just sat there? What'd you do? Or did they make an announcement saying, attention, Jay, we're not gonna tell you. I bet they didn't. Now the fact they didn't tell you is bad. The fact that you didn't ask is worse. Let me know which one you did. Okay, Rachel says, which airline just raised the check back fee? Well, started with American. Then uh, JetBlue kicked in, Delta kicked in behind them. I'm waiting to see if United did it as well. Uh, okay, Sarah says, how long does it take to de-ice a plane typically? I was at DIA and it took a solid hour. Is this normal? Yes, it's normal if you design your de-icing facility in a stupid way. And almost every U.S. airport is stupid. I'm here in France, so they figured out de-icing a long time ago. You know what they do at Charles de Gaulle? They don't leave de-icing to the individual airlines to do, right? Oh, by the way, they subcontract out and outsource. Here we go again. No. What they do is they say, okay, we know when the temperature drops below a certain degree, we've got certain humidity in the air, every plane has to be de-iced. So you'll still push back from the gate on time. You'll go down the taxiway. And just before you get the turn to go to the runway, there's a de-icing facility, sort of like a car wash. And it's, it's run by the airport. They charge the airline separately. And you go through it right before you take off. The problem with U.S. airports and U.S. airlines is they do the de-icing at the gate. Then you join a long line of 35 planes waiting to get to the runway. By the time you get out there, you got to de-ice again. Stupidity. The good thing about the de-icing facilities in France is that all those toxic fluids that they're using to de-ice are captured in drains right there in that facility and not going into the main water supply or the sewage system. It's a win-win for everybody. Come on, U.S. airlines. Figure it out. Don't outsource. Let the airports do it. Let them build the facilities, pay for that. And by the way, operationally, you'll save money on fuel. You'll save money on misconnections. You'll save money on toxicity. And you might even save money just in attitude. Think about that. Okay. Uh, here's one. Oh, time to go to the photo of the week. Excuse me. And I love this photo of the week. Let's go to it. It's coming up. Look at that photo. Can't make that up. And... Believe it or not, this, one, this week's winner, I'm going to give you her name, Pamela Anderson. I don't think it's that Pamela Anderson, but maybe she'll correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, she, this photo was taken after a fresh snow in the mountains of Libby, Montana. I love it. And they actually stood long enough to be posing. Can't beat that. I love that it's black and white. Ansel Adams, you had the right idea. If you think your photo qualifies for the photo of the week, you know what to do. Just email us to photocontest at petergreenberg.com. And if we think you qualify, guess what? You get to stand up there right next to Pamela 
and show off your photo of the week. Let me quickly go back and see if we have any last minute questions before I give you some housekeeping notes. I think, oh, Jumbo from Tanzania. Okay, and Patty agrees with me that Prague is fairy tale and fabulous. Don't forget the candy stores. Um, Karina, are you actually correct about this? The woman who just wrote me about the seatbelts not working, she said on two of my flights, I was told to tie a knot. How crazy is that? That's illegal. Do me a favor, Karina. I hope you recorded the, the, the airline, the flight number, and the date. I'm going to get into that. That's ridiculous, okay? And for those of you who think that wearing seatbelts is silly, let me tell you what I do. And you're going to think I'm silly. I never wear my seatbelt during takeoff or landing because seatbelts are made to help you in the event of an aborted takeoff or a hard landing when planes used to do that at 90 miles an hour. They do it now at 150 to 160 miles an hour. If you're wearing a seatbelt during a hard landing or an aborted takeoff, it could break your pelvis. And if there's a resulting fire and smoke, you, won't, you, you can't walk. You, you, could be, you could be consumed by, this, by the toxic smoke. But I always wear my seatbelt once we're in the air, because there's nothing more dangerous and more lethal than clear air turbulence, CAT. The pilots can't see it on their weather radar. You could drop a thousand feet. Happened to a 787 on the, uh, just two weeks ago on Latam, and uh, dozens of people were injured, right? Some seriously. So I always wear the seatbelt when we're in the air, right? If you got to go to the bathroom, do it, then get back, refashion your seatbelt. Okay. Um, Patty says, my seatbelt broke off my flight from Denver to Phoenix in 1966, and I still have it. And the airline's still looking for you. <laughs> oh, my goodness. All right. Uh, love that. I love that line. All right. Now a couple of housekeeping notes. Our radio show this week, Eye on Travel this Saturday, is coming from the amazing Four Seasons Hotel in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. I hope you'll tune in. If you can't find it in your area, not a problem. Just go to our website with the imaginative name, petergreenberg.com. Log in, you'll see the radio icon, hit that. At about 10.05 a.m. Eastern time, you'll hear the whole show. Hope you'll be able to join us. Of course, we have other things to report, and that is, if you watch our regular website, petergreenberg.com, you're going to see some of our newest pieces that we're mounting on the air right now, and I hope you get a chance to see those. Remember, Travel Detective Season 9 is premiering in about a month. So check your local listings on PBS. It will also air on Amazon Prime and Apple TV Plus. And uh, I hope you'll do that as well. We will be reporting next week, uh, at least on my television shoots and on my radio as well, from, guess where? Normandy and Omaha, Utah Beach, the museum there, the, the American cemetery there, which is daunting and makes you, it, it literally takes your breath away. If you want to remember we don't celebrate it. We remember it. June 6th, 1944. So we'll talk to you then. In the meantime, I'm getting on a plane very soon. We'll see you next week from a distant remote location somewhere around the world. Anthony Protus Chung, thank you for handling everything back in Los Angeles. Everybody be safe. We will continue to update on the Baltimore bridge collapse. We will continue to operate update on the Boeing investigation, which is not going away anytime soon. And hopefully the FAA will get its act together sooner than later. We'll see you next week, everybody. Have a great rest of the week.